Um, hi, everyone. This presentation is for you. How's that? I mean, gosh, that's amazing. Okay, can I just confess something? All I did is copy and paste a little section out of my book and change the word book to presentation. I didn't realize it was going to be like five times. So I'm so grateful to be here. I like to start my presentation with just a moment of mindfulness. So if you're willing, if you're not willing, I can work with that too. But I invite you to find a comfortable position. And if it feels right for you, gently close your eyes. And we begin by taking a nice deep conscious breath together. And on the exhale, simply allowing yourself to become fully present. Bringing your full attention and intention to this very moment. And so the invitation here is to simply check in and notice. Notice where you're at physically. Notice any thoughts that are present. Noticing the emotional inner landscape. And then finally, we drop down into that place of inner stillness as we set the intention for our time together. So my intention is to be open and receptive, authentic, And we just take a few moments in the silence. And with gratitude, we slowly begin to bring our awareness back into this time and space and gently open our eyes. Okay, thank you for that. That's very helpful for me. I'm so grateful to be here. I am filling in, of course, our incredible presenter. I hopefully will be back soon because we love her. And I love just, you know, just prop me up, wind me up, and I'm here to speak anytime because I love it. Someone reached out to me and said, I heard you love to talk. Ah, that's true. <laughs> but I want to start, before I even go into that, I want to just acknowledge or invite that this can be a conversation and that Nicole has a, a microphone. I'm not saying let's do q and A. I'm saying let's have a conversation because I really think that that is so rich, especially in the work that we do, right? Community. Um, I, I, I'm thinking back uh, when I was in early recovery, how important community was. And I find today that my community is this field. And sometimes I think it's easy to be in work mode. I'm looking at you because we've had some beautiful moments in this room, actually, um, where we can drop in and actually be really authentic with one another as well about what it really means to be in this field and do this work. Um, I want to tell just a little bit of my own story, but it's going to be very brief. Um, and the reason I start with my own story is because I accidentally, oops, started working in this field. It was never my intention. As a matter of fact, I was like, I will never ever, ever, ever work in the addiction <laughs> treatment field. No, thank you. So um, I'm going to start in an interesting place. Um, no, I'm not going to start there, actually. I'm going to say that I remember being a very happy child, a very, very happy child. And as a matter of fact, my mom often says I was one of the happiest toddlers she's ever met. And I just remember being so grateful. I was an effervescent little boy. As a matter of fact, my mom, since we're here, this is AMP, my mom said by the time I was four, she realized I was most likely gonna grow up to be gay, and I often show her my three-year-old picture, which I have, so let's pull it out. <laughs> and I will say, Mom, what took you so long? I, I have to show it, because here I am, right? I didn't plan this, by the way, but you know, why not? Oh here I am at three years old. My mom and my dad are both Virgos, so if you're into astrology at all, everything was very precise growing up. <laughs> Right? I mean, come on. I'm like, Mom, there I am at three, right? Oh, Jesus. Every year, every year on our birthday, we went to Sears to get our, our portrait. Every year. And I actually remember that exact photo. And I remember just feeling so filled with joy. And I didn't really understand yet that Indiana in the 19-somethings 
wasn't quite ready for this effervescent little boy, <laughs> right? Um, it was okay to be me in my household. As a matter of fact, the first time I did drag was when I was eight and it was Halloween and I went to school and I just kept running up and down the hallway saying, bigger boobs, mom, bigger boobs. She's like, okay, okay. I, aren't they big enough? No, I want them bigger. So I felt very loved and accepted in my home and then I went out in the world and realized that there was a paradigm of what it meant to be a boy and I didn't quite fit that mold. I also grew up in a household where what people said, what people did, and the energy I felt were three totally different and incongruent things. I just learned this year, my dad told me, we went on a family cruise and my dad told me that he never wanted to marry my mother. He was 19 and she was 20 and the bishop of our cathedral said, you will marry her. So to say it was a loveless marriage, it's like, oh my gosh, I finally have words to put to this feeling that I felt like, why are these two in a relationship? My dad was very busy with women and some men that weren't my mother. No one talked about it and everyone knew. My uncles are what we would today call, we would call them perpetrators back then. And I'm saying this, I'm saying, I'm just gonna say it. Back then we called them men. <laughs> Right? The way that they talked about women was uh, crushing to my soul. I had an uncle, a great uncle, who was gay. Now, I want to set the stage here. He was born in the early 1900s, my grandmother's brother. He had a partner, we called them both uncle, but they weren't gay. My grandmother went to her grave saying, he's not gay, what are you talking about? <laughs> I remember one day, he came into the house and I went running over to him. I was about this tall. I went running over and threw my arms around him and he pushed me and said, boys don't hug men like that. And he shot his internalized homophobia right into me. And I have a lot of compassion for him, of course, now. And I understand intellectually now that that's the best he could do in the time that he was born. I mean, I think he was born in like 1905 in Indiana. I mean, like, come on. Right? But what happened to me is I started to shut down and I started to protect myself from the pain of the world. And by the way, there was a war happening, which there always is a war happening on planet Earth, I think. I think that's true. But this was one of the wars that was on TV 24 hours a day. And I had a profound experience of closing my heart and I made some massive decisions about myself that really had nothing to do with me. I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, I'm not lovable. And from that moment, that was the frequency that I carried about myself and I kept finding myself choosing relationships and situations to confirm the core false belief. This has become the foundation of my work because starting to work in the field, well, okay, so I got sober in 1986. I was suicidal when I was two years sober. The paradigm was don't worry about anything but not drinking back in the day. Just go to another meeting. Just go work a step. You don't worry. You're okay. And I'm like, I want to die. And luckily, I met a woman who changed my life and took me on a journey, a twofold journey of one, reconnecting with my true and essential nature that preceded the core decision that I was broken. And two, unlearning everything I'd ever been taught and every decision I'd ever made that were counter to the knowing that I'm a whole and perfect spiritual being. I started working in the field in 2008 or nine. Sometimes I'm not great at years, but it was one of those years, um, accidentally. <laughs> I had gone back to school when I was 40 and I, my schooling was in spirituality and I started a spiritual community and that was my path and no one was going to tell me anything other than that. I had written my first book and I, my friend of mine started working in this field and he was telling me about the place he was working and there was something deep within me I knew I was supposed to be there. And I was like, oh, come on. So I sent my application in, my resume, and they're like, you have zero experience in this field. Uh, thank you for submitting, blah, blah, blah. It's sort of like getting those, like, thank you for submitting your speaker proposal. Right, we know how it goes. Um, I'm looking at you because we know, right? Thank you so much. We had so many great, you know, anyway. Um, I emailed back and said, that's really weird because I know I'm supposed to be there. And she said, 
wow, that's, wow, that's crazy, call me, called her. And she's like, well, I have to meet you now, like who would respond with that? And I was like, it's not even really me, it genuinely is this knowing that I'm supposed to be there. Anyway, I go in for my interview and it turns out my friend was the CEO and I had no idea. And he's like, hire that guy. So I started working in the field and the reason I preface all of that is what I'm really here to talk about today is the four rooms. And there's an Indian proverb that says, we're a house with four rooms, physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual. And when I came into the field, um, I was 20 something years in recovery. I had done enough of my own healing, enough of my own healing, there's not a finish line, but enough to know that what I experienced in my first few weeks of treatment in some ways were actually shocking to me. Exactly. That's kind of how I felt. That sounded like a little, that sounded like a cartoon, you know, the ones where... <laughs> there were two things that were really striking to me when I started working in our, in our field. One, people were coming back to treatment three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. And what I heard people saying to these precious, and I'm going to be very conscious about my language here, these precious, beautiful souls who were at the most painful moment in their life, they were being told, what are you going to do differently this time? When are you going to surrender and realize you don't know anything? And it was crushing to my soul. I'm just going to be fully transparent. Because that paradigm of looking at the person who is at a moment of the greatest possibility that they can change their life, we're adding shame to the shame that they already are experiencing. Because what happened in my journey, Mary Helen, this beautiful Southern woman, where are you there? Back to this, you know, I'm not calling you a beautiful Southern woman, although. Um, she would say to me, darling, you're so precious and I would feel like I was gonna throw up because I believed very deeply that I was broken. And so I saw us administering, if you will, this same paradigm of you're broken, you don't know anything, when are you gonna surrender and do it our way? And I understand actually, I understand why. And the second thing is I would sit in clinical meetings and I would hear clinicians, well-meaning clinicians, refer to their clients as their diagnosis. She's so borderline. He's so bipolar. And so I came in asking some different questions. And my number one question was, what if, I like what if, what if I were to view every person I sit with through the lens of finding their inherent wholeness. Knowing that they came into the world as perfect beings and had been programmed to believe they're damaged. And I've identified in my own experience the three root causes of addiction, and I want to be clear about something, physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual. I'm talking about the spiritual room here. We're going to dive into that in a few minutes. The three root causes of addiction to me in that spiritual room are unresolved trauma, spiritual disconnection and toxic shame and so shame doesn't heal shame right and trauma doesn't heal trauma so I wanted to start with that before I kind of dive into the spiritual room and then I absolutely want to open it up for a conversation here in a few minutes but a lot of the uh, modalities of treatment focus on the physical and the mental in our field, right? As a matter of fact, if you go to almost any conference, you're gonna get a PowerPoint and you're gonna get the science of addiction, which by the way, is very useful, of course. Or we hear that it's a disease, that it lives in the mind or in the body, which absolutely might be true. It's not the whole story. There's something else happening in addition to that. And my curiosity starting in this field was, how can we bring this other question, what if the person I'm sitting with is actually a whole and perfect being, and that everything they've been doing, addiction, hypersexuality, shopping, codependency, all the terms we use, are actually brilliant strategies to manage the shame and the unresolved trauma. 
And what I want to talk about today in, in, in the spiritual room, what does it mean? Um, you know, Nicole and I are very passionate with conscious recovery. Every year we create a theme. I create a theme for myself. And the theme for the year is healing the healers. Because what I wit have witnessed is when we're only focused on the behavior of our clients, we're not actually getting down to the root causes that are driving the addiction. And when we're looking at the addiction as the problem that needs to be eradicated, we might be missing the spiritual piece of this, which is what is the soul's desire? What are our clients truly wanting? And I have this crazy idea that all of it is a search for love and connection. Cocaine, all of it. And if I begin to look for what is whole and complete with a person, not only is it more effective, because quantum mechanics is now measuring what mystics have been saying for 25 or 3,000, 2,500 to 3,000 years, and that is the observer has a profound effect. Everyone knows quantum mechanics, right? If, if we do it, this is gonna be very much pop science, by the way. I don't know why I'm coming over here, but um, <laughs> these are the scientists in the room. I, I feel it. Um, when we are looking for a particular outcome, there's a dramatically higher probability that we will discover that outcome. It's profound. So if I'm saying what's broken about you, and I'm sitting with you in a session or in a group, and you're sharing, and while you're talking, I'm doing this because I know I'm supposed to be a conscious listener, but really I'm diagnosing you what's getting created in the field. And what might get created if I were to be curious with you co-curious with you. It's this new term that I sort of, I, I thought I created it, but then I Googled it. Some other people are using it. <laughs> but be co-curious together. Come together and be curious about this rather than thinking, I know what this is. Now the reason I talk about that as it relates to Heal the Healer is I see our field with a high degree of burnout. I see our field having people that get burnt out and then go to another program and it's going to be different this time and then they work for a year and they get burnt out. Maybe I'll go to private practice. This time it'll be different. I'm like, I know yes, private practice. Um, and then, oh, I still feel burnt out and I know that's probably not true for you. Um, so what's at the root of this? I've discovered something for myself, and this might not be true for you, but it's profoundly simple because I actually think the deepest truths are so simple. When I think you are broken, and it's my job to fix you, I'm exhausted. And by the way, it doesn't really work, right? So if I'm co-curious with you, and I start to ask some questions, that might lead you to an inner exploration. And the greatest paradox is every human being has within them the ability to heal, but they can't do it alone or they wouldn't be sitting in front of me. So is my job to tell someone what they need to do, even if it's subtle? Am I judging you? I did a, I did a talk at Finding Freedom, the first one during COVID. We had really big audiences on Zoom in early COVID. It's like a thousand people in the room, like, oh, okay. But it was called Checking Your Unconscious Biases in the Therapeutic Alliance. And in other words, what am I judging about the person sitting in front of me and can they feel it? And I invited people to look at a series of slides. I knew my audience, right? It was an LGBTQ plus event. So I showed mixed race couples, I showed an old man with a younger woman, I showed a lot of different things. And then I said, all I'm asking you to do is to see if you feel something in your body, if you have an emotional response, or if you have a thought. I'm not gonna ask you to share them, I'm just gonna ask you to see what you feel or what you experience as you look at these slides. And then I said, okay, take a deep breath. And then I showed someone wearing a Make America Great hat and someone holding a Confederate flag. And the invitation was, did I have a response or a reaction? And the invitation as clinicians is to say, how is that affecting the field? I may have personal opinions about that. I may not have in my personal life those connections, but if someone walks in to my office and I'm working in a treatment program, if you're in private practice, you get to have your specialty. If they're, if they're wearing a Make America Great hat, am I as still as open and loving as present with that person? 
And so the reason I'm saying that, I don't actually know why I'm saying that, to tell you the truth, but it might be that I realize um, that our clients who have trauma, which are 100% of them, Right, because trauma, and I'm not a big fan of big T, little t trauma, that framework, because we're saying your trauma is big and my trauma is small. But the truth is trauma is different for every single person. I had a very innocuous event happen in kindergarten or first grade where I decided I was stupid. Someone else sitting next to me would not have had, it would have been nothing for them. Right, so it's less about what happened and more about what I decided about myself because of what happened. We're not minimizing the event, but we're really asking, what did you decide about yourself? So for our clients who have trauma, they are absolutely attuned to who's safe and who isn't. Right? And so I think in this circle, we might say we want to advocate for our LGBTQ plus clients so that they get that, but am I going to invite myself to do it too? with someone with a Make America Great hat again, right? Make America Great, I don't know what I'm saying. So can I be open and present with every person and how does that affect the field? And what I'm gonna say in closing and then we're gonna open it up for at least 15 minutes of conversation because I know y'all have a lot to say. If it's true, which it is true, that only about 10% of the way we communicate is through words, is what I'm about to say to you important? Or is it possibly much less important than how I'm being with you? What am I holding? What am I feeling about you? What energy am I bringing to this conversation? And what happens if I'm looking at you as broken and I'm diagnosing you? And what might happen if we would be co-curious and start asking, I wonder what you're experiencing right now? And sometimes just the idea, the what if question, what if you came into the world as a perfect being and you've been programmed to believe that you're limited or damaged or broken, and we see that in our community, right? That was my story because I was a little gay boy in Indiana, born in 1965, okay, I'll say it. Um, I believed I was fundamentally broken. And if we look at our community, the LGBTQ plus community, unresolved trauma, spiritual disconnection, and toxic shame. I don't know, I know it's changing, but anyone of a certain age, we have all three of those. It's an almost an automatic in our community. And so there's no surprise to me that we have higher rates of addiction, but we're also super creative. Because uh, I took a personality test, and it's, my number one trait was highly attuned to the motivation of others. And that's because I had to be, I, that was a survival skill for me. I couldn't actually trust what people were saying, so I had to feel the energy. What are they, who is really safe? My uncle's not safe. My parents aren't in love. What's going on here? I had to learn how to feel energy, and I'm extremely grateful for that. And I think our community has such a high degree of that, that creativity, because so many of us have had to like play a role. Let me pretend, let me pretend to be a man, whatever that meant back, back then. But let me tell you what it didn't mean. <laughs> okay, so with that, why don't we open it up? Um, Nicole has a microphone, so please wait for the microphone to arrive. It's actually not a speaker for this room, so don't say I know you can hear me, because I know y'all how you all are. This is for the camera so that they, the audience can hear. Okay, who has questions, comments, smart remarks? Hi, uh, Hi. Joey. She, her, I am with uh, Phoenix. I'm a volunteer coordinator. Thank you mm -hmm. for this. Um, I mean, there, how I can limit this to one question, I don't know, because I have so many. Yeah. Um, but the thing that stands out to me the most is in my own recovery and with working with people in recovery, shame, yeah. it almost killed me. Yeah. And we as a community in general, particularly when we're talking about 12 steps, we quantify success with time. Yeah. And I understand why like relapse is so dangerous and you might not come back, you could die. Yeah. But if we are showing people that long-term recovery is success, how are we alleviating that shame for the person that is not experiencing Beautiful. that? Thank you. 
Um, there's two things I want to say about that. One, um, the reason that healing the healers is so important to me, and I think this is something, and I'm just going to say it, sorry Patrick, but Dr. Patrick Lockwood and I, we've bonded over one thing, and that thing is how um, any community who has experienced trauma can often be in an unconscious trauma response, right? Whether that's a race group, gender, um, and sexual orientation and gender identity, we've gone through trauma. And sometimes as a community, we have a trauma response. I'm not sure if this is even related to what you said, but I hope it is. We, and we might have a trauma response that shows up as we want to fight for people. And what would happen if I were to start to look at what re what's required within me to be healed or to be in the process of healing so that instead of fighting, I'm standing for something, right? And so how I think that relates to what you're saying to me is if I haven't, and this is, I think, another very simple thing, I cannot possibly allow the person sitting in front of me to go any deeper than I've gone myself because I will stop it either unconsciously or consciously. Maybe we'll say, oh, we're a short-term program. We don't address trauma, but here, let me, let's talk about that in therapy, right? I've seen it. I've seen clinicians do that in group. Oh, 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 because we might be afraid of what? People are going to get triggered, yeah. which is, by the way, the greatest <laughs> gift of being in treatment. Let's activate this stuff in a safe environment so that we can heal it. But what I, what, what to me, what is true is it's uncomfortable for me if you're trying to go any deeper than I've gone myself. And so shame is that too. Um, and, and I agree, you know, um, I honestly sometimes when it comes around and it's time to post how many years, because it's 37 years in June for me, there's a part of me who doesn't necessarily want to post that. Well, first of all, they're like, how old are you? <laughs> And I'm like, come on. <laughs> but this, this focus on time as an identity, I think, can be, it's, it's a double thing, right? Because it's a beautiful thing because we're celebrating recovery. But um, I think there's, there is um, shame that gets put on people who relapse, right? I, there was a guy, oh my gosh, okay, I can share this because it's a really, I think it's a beautiful story. I got sober in Dallas. I got sober in Dallas in the 80s and I got sober in North Dallas. So if you know Dallas, Dallas is very, we're going to have this bond, very international cosmopolitan city in three zip codes. <laughs> and if you get out of those zip codes, oh, I'm in Texas. But by the way, that's not much different in California. I'm just going to say it, right? So um, little gay boy getting sober, straight meetings, whatever that means, right? Um, and there was this guy he was, I think he was from Mississippi. And I'd walk in and he would say, homosexuals are going to burn in the pool of fire. Every day. And every night he relapsed. And every day he came back and he said, my name is blah, blah, blah. And my God given sobriety date is yesterday. Why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because, I mean, he literally said to me, I'm going to burn in the pool of fire every day I walked into an AA meeting. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> Nobody stopped him? Nobody said anything? So here's the beauty. They loved him where he was at, and they loved me where I was at. Okay. Right? Which is good. That's the gift. Yeah. But here's what happened. At about one year, he finally got, to get, he finally got a year. And he said, uh, I need to make some amends to you. And I'm like, I'm scared. Do I, am I going to go in a room and close the door with you, or do I need someone with me? And he said, I've never told anyone but my sponsor, but when I was using, I was selling my body to men every single day. And I had so much guilt and shame about that. And I was just projecting that onto you. And he said, guess what my sponsor is making me do? I hear you're speaking at the gay meeting. I have to go sit in the front row. It was so beautiful. Like he, he was literally crying when I was talking. I was literally crying, right? Because that's a moment of healing that can happen. I'll just leave that there. Did we cover what you're talking about? Maybe? Okay, where's that microphone? I got the actual mic. Come on. <laughs> yeah, you like this. <laughs> so, so light. 
So thank you, TJ. Um, that was great. And um, so I grew up with my, you know, as, as a gay man in the South myself as well, yeah. maybe not Indiana, but, you know, just just the same thing, you know, in a, in a, in a fundamentalist Christian yeah. home, um, you know, where, you know, I, I read this article about um, rapture trauma. Yeah. Um, because I was always, I never thought I would be taken in the rapture. You know, sometimes I would, if I couldn't, my, my mom didn't answer the phone, I would be afraid that I was left behind. Um, you know, because I, because I knew I was a gay, and, and because I knew I was gay, and church would always teach that you're not going to heaven. You're, yeah. you're, we're, you're, you're, gonna, you're going to hell. Um, yeah. How do you, how, how, do, how does this, how does what, what you're working on, how do you, I mean, so I'm, I'm traumatized. I mean, my mother, all, yeah. her 100% response to me all the time was, why can't we be, why can't we just be normal? <laughs> Which basically meant that I was, something was wrong with me. I'm, right. you know, there's something wrong with me. Right. How did, how do you, so now every time I talk to her, which is every, almost every day, because, you know, I talk to my mom, I'm a gay man. Um, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> how do you, how do you, re how do you reconcile that trauma so, so that I'm not re-traumatized every fucking day by this? Thank you. Beautiful question. Um, I want to invite, before I even answer that, I want to invite us to take a look at something that we use in our field and in our recovery circles when we call people normies. Mm -hmm. What are we saying about ourselves? Um, right. It's so uncomfortable this. to call yourself that too. Right. Like, I don't I'm a I'm normie. Not. What does that mean, right? What does that mean? Right. So there's, it's, we're creating a division. So, so here's the thing that I think is really important for me in my journey, and I've seen this become very effective. I'm looking at you again. I know you have trauma as a specialty in your practice, so maybe we'll hear from you too. Um, Bessel van der Kolk says, trauma doesn't show up as a memory. It shows up as a reaction. Right, and it's something that's in the body, right? Something that happens, it's, you know, and so um, I'm not a big fan of the word trigger. Um, uh, in conscious recovery, there's a, we do a group and we have people go around and identify one of their triggers as the check-in and it's totally a trap. And almost all of them say something outside. My mom, my girlfriend, my, my job, my boss. And then we say, well, is that actually what's happening or is it a wound that's getting touched? Right, and so what's getting activated as a starting point, but here, here's the thing that for me that's really important, it's not an intellectual process only. As a matter of fact, I might even be so bold as to say it's actually not an intellectual process, right? Because I decided I was stupid when I was five years old, and as an adult, I had plenty of evidence to show that I wasn't. I also had a lot to show I was because I believed it, so I manifested that all the time. It's really about helping someone understand what's happening in their body. When we're a young child, our brains aren't even developed enough to understand nuance. I remember trying to teach my nephew when he was five and my mom took his plane and stomped on it what mental illness was. <laughs> right? This is not about you. Right? How do you tell a five-year-old? So our brains aren't even developed enough. If one of our parents is angry, I must be bad. That's why people who have sexual trauma sometimes feel shame, even though, of course, we know it wasn't their fault. So as an adult, we might try to talk ourselves out of it, or we say, okay, here's the traumatic event, and that led to this core false belief that I have about myself. Let me change that belief. But really, it's about getting down to what did it feel like and what's the energy that's stored in the body? And can I be present with what's happening now? In other words, simply said, I feel it. Right? And the, the, the um, framework for me is what would I be experiencing without the story? Because it's not about going back and re-traumatizing ourselves and going back to the traumatic event over and over again. It's what's alive within me and can I be present enough because I have this profound idea if addiction is running from or numbing emotions, then recovery is what? Learning how to be present with them and feel them, right? And we say this, and yet we still say things like, uh, you, you, you should get rid of your anger, <laughs> right? Instead of like, okay, here's anger, let's, let's be present with it. And then we can get down to what's underneath it. So rather than saying to someone, you need to go to anger management, we could ask, what is the anger managing? 
right? So I, I pick up the phone, I talk to my mom, I'm noticing the physical reaction, I'm noticing what's happening. I might want to go into a story, I might want to talk myself out of it, I might want to justify her behavior, all the different layers. Instead, it's like, let me see what's present. You have your hand up? Oh, sold to the woman. In, no, <laughs> Michelle, you just, okay, so it's really being present with what is happening in the moment without, she didn't actually have her hand oh, okay. up, but I mean, maybe she does. That's on point, just in case. No. Okay. Did that address that some, right? How, how, how was that? Yeah, good? What, um, let me ask you, I'm gonna put you on the spot, Jace. What do you do with someone that you're sitting with when they ask you the question, how do I actually heal this trauma? I know that's a really big question. No, yeah, so I'm gonna yeah. give you a moment, but there's a microphone. <laughs> um, so I think um, a lot of what you're saying like with trauma is like yeah. sometimes it's a focus on like something that's wrong with me, right? right. Or like um, it's an identity question or about thoughts. And I think sometimes expanding that idea of like, where are these ideas coming from? Realizing yep. that these aren't absolute truths that yep. are, exist, but really these are actually things that other people might believe, society believes about you, culture believes about you, that's placed onto you. And we internalize that and start telling ourselves those things. And based off of that, it creates a lens of how we see everything, how right. we see the world, right. how we see ourselves. And I think a lot of times in working with clients, it's slowing down that lens, becoming aware of the lens and peeling it back, trying on other lenses. And that question, what if, is so beautiful because what if the world was this? Yeah. What if we actually believe this about ourselves? What if these things about you, the fact that you identify this way, gender presentation, everything, could have a different meaning? then what would be different about your experiencing? And slowly right. clients start to really get to experience that and say, you know what? Oh, actually, this is a strength. Or actually, this feels great. And actually, I really love these things about myself. And I feel safe in these areas. I see other people that see that same thing about me. They have that lens on. And it slowly starts to change those beliefs and that experiencing. And it brings back, like you were saying, it's not just a mental thing. It's sure it's a process that's happening in our brain. But where trauma really lives and how memory works is it's also our physical experiencing it's emotional you know we like to think sometimes memory is like a roll of tape and every time you recall that tape it's the same thing right and it's exactly how it happened but actually everything that gets coded with that the things that we're feeling the beliefs that we have the thoughts at the time all get stored at the same time and what's great about working the trauma in that way of like the what if let's look at these different lenses is every time we recall that tape we actually change the memory we actually change the experience and if we experience it in a safe place or with safe people, it changes that experience as well. And now every time we recall that memory, it can also be something where it's like, oh, you know what? It actually can have this meaning instead. I don't have to have this belief about it anymore. And now that I think about it this way, I actually realized it was their thing, it wasn't mine. It was their belief, it wasn't mine. And that agency comes back and this feeling of being able to accept ourselves. Is Beautiful, Beautif beautifully said. And I wanted to like lean into something because what you just said is so profound and I want everyone to like, let's pause and I like to sometimes be provocative. So I, I did a training recently and the, C the um, clinical director came up to me at the break and said, you didn't say you can change the past, right? Because someone just told me, you said you can change the past. I'm like, yes, I did. And I want to clarify what I meant. So I clarified it to her, and then I clarified it to the group. We think memory is solid, but the truth is it's alive in my mind. What we want to be careful about is not to say that didn't happen. We would never say that, of course. But we have, an, we have a memory, and then memory, the way the brain works is we actually add to that memory over the years. And so when I first got sober, I, I went to my sisters to ask their perspective on our events of our childhood knowing full well they would have a different perspective but what I didn't expect was they had totally different stories my dad my story dad wasn't home I even said it today busy with people who weren't my mom never home not loving therefore I decided I was unlovable my sister was like what he was there for dinner every evening I'm like what every evening did we have the same dad? right did we have the same dad and guess what the answer is not really. we didn't have the same dad Right, because it was something about my memory that I had built upon over the years and concretized that into my unconscious. Right, so we're not saying it didn't happen. What we're saying is 
Let's go back to it. Where did this core false belief originate? It might be an event. It might be a series of events. It might be living on planet Earth. But what would it be like is one of my favorite questions. What would it be like if you didn't believe this about yourself? Not, not what would you think. What would it be like? Well, I would, I would be lighter. I would have some freedom. Right? And so we just want to sit in that question. The questions expand and judgment re contracts, right? So if I say this is what it is, and that's why some of the models that are only in the mind, you know, opposite action, change that core false belief, all of that is useful to a point. But what, what I hear you saying is, but let's get down and say, what were those original decisions? And can you, not through the, the mental lens of like change the idea, like talk yourself out of it, but what was it actually like at five years old to be told there's something wrong with you and you're going to hell? I mean, feel how big that is, right? And so then to start to, to unlearn that in a way of not having that be the ultimate truth, and then we can start seeing that the trajectory, and in that way, guess what? We kind of changed the past, right? We changed our experience of it. Do we have time for one more? It's three minutes till one. I don't know what time we're supposed to stop. We have time for one more. Anybody? Anyone? It's not the question. Oh, it doesn't need to be a question. You know, it's funny. The memory thing, it just brought back a memory. <laughs> I, for years, I had this memory of being in college. I played the piano, and I... The way I remembered it was that I completely stopped playing at a recital mm. for like minutes. And then I decided, oh, I'm changing my major. So I dropped piano. And then for years I thought, oh, I'm so bad at this thing. And people would say, oh, like even castings, they'd be like, can you play in this musical? I said, oh, no, no, because this thing happened to me. Yeah. And so like the story about my talent was just like, and then a few years ago, a friend was like, oh, I have that on VHS. Oh, wow. And we watched it. Wow. And I didn't even stop. Wow. I was like, I said, I, we'd have to watch this again. Because I know I stopped. Because I stopped for minutes. Isn't that and interesting? Like, and I, I didn't even stop. So right. like the idea of, like, I mean, I'm living proof that what you're saying is true. Right. Yeah. Right. And wouldn't it be cool if we could, like, I guess we can, like, when you said that, I remembered that. I said, well, what does that mean for the other things that I've right. told, you know, Yourself. the story of myself based over on these memories? Exactly. So, um, yeah. Yeah, and so it's a very delicate conversation because we're not going to say it didn't happen, especially someone who has, like, sexual trauma. And I go, well, what if that never happened? Right? We're not going to say that. But what we are going to say is, what did you decide about yourself based on that event? What was the core experience and what energy did you then absorb because of that? Like that experience with my uncle. Did that ever happen? I don't know, but that's what I remembered. So that moment became a very, very big, huge core decision that I made about myself in the world. So, um, okay, so what I want to say in closing, everyone, is thank you. Um, and if no one has told you yet today, you are a whole and perfect spiritual being. I also got permission to invite all of you to our conference. I'm just going to ask you to pass these postcards around. Happening in September, emergence. So we want to invite you to that. And uh, mostly what I want to say is thank you. And thank you for your yes to doing this incredible work in the world. Thank you. Thank you.